I was just looking at this uh, poster here and I see they have a shot of me with my mortar board on. Um, and here I am supposedly in the Fedora movie. Um, I, 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 a student took that as a joke and I put it on Facebook. And <laughs> finding it uh, there was a little bit surprising. Uh, one of the problems in selecting something to read for an event like this, which I absolutely love to do, uh, because I think it, all writers are egoists at heart, is um, to find something that will suit the audience and having no idea who you were going to be or what audience I was going to have. I decided on the way down, actually I uh, brought several things with me, to use something that has just been accepted for publication, will be out in the New Madrid uh, Literary Journal, which is a, a really fine, small uh, journal that was published in uh, Tennessee. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased to have that. Now this is not a, an entirely a fiction piece. It's what is, it falls under the ages of a new uh, sort of enthousi enthusiasm for a form called uh, creative nonfiction, which uh, allows me to lie uh, all the way through, <laughs> uh, but not entirely. So I think you'll, I think you'll find it interesting, um, particularly because of what I know about the history of this area and also the small towns throughout Texas, which is really my subject. Uh, I have an epigraph for the story. The story's title is Railroad Man, and the epigraph for it comes from a Fred Eaglesmith song called I Like Trains, and the epigraph is I like trains that whisper your name. My father was a railroad man. That isn't a particularly startling statement, but there was a time when to say such a thing was to define who I was, who we were as a family, and certainly who he was. To be a railroad man was to be something special in a community, especially when the community, like thousands of communities across America, was a railroad town. I was born and grew up in a railroad town. My father was a railroad man. In the western environs of the United States, a particular phenomenon is that small towns along major highways are almost consistently 30 miles apart. This isn't something a lot of today's motorists notice since they are whizzing by at 70 plus miles per hour, smoothly skirting around many if not most of these tiny bergs that sprang up out of the prairie over a century ago, flourished and died when urbanization conquered the agrarian lifestyle of America and lured away the best of its people to much less rewarding and less fulfilling lives in the cities. But if one is astute, one notices this consistency of distance between them and might wonder why. The answer is simple. 30 miles was about as far as a steam-driven bullgein, as steam locomotives were sometimes called in the latter half of the 19th century, could travel without having to stop for water. The term given these railroad towns was jerkwaters, or possibly whistle stops. They were places where trains would sound their whistles, long short, long short, long short, as they approached the grade crossings, making a huge cacophony as they slowed to pass through a gate and crossed a switch, then ground to a tenuous halt and soofed and sighed in smoking, steaming impatience, while the deadhead, or fireman, jerked down the trough from a slide, siding tower and replenished the water in their boilers so they could then blow themselves back to a boil and grind into movement once more for another 30-mile run. In the early days of telegraphy, 30 miles was about as far as an ele electronic telegraph signal could travel without having to be received and retransmitted to some more distant destination. Usually, this is where a depot and then a town would be built, each umbilically connected to the next by steel rail and a telegraph wire in a time when roads tended to run to impassable mud when it rained and, there were, there were and were uncertain in the best of weather. Hence, the 30-mile rule applies throughout the United States. Anything shorter was called a milk run. The steam locomotives and trains they pulled were an inexorable part of the American landscape. The din they made signals arrivals and departures from the outside world. Whistles, bells, screeching, steel on steel, the hiss of air brakes and rumbling clatter of cars jumbling and shouldering their bulk up and down the track behind a smoking leviathan was a celebration of sorts, a festival of noise and excitement. They had names, 
the aristocrat, the diplomat, the silver star, the Texas Express, the pioneer, the mountain queen, Denver City, the fast-flying vestibule, the overland flyer, the Dixie flyer. There are trails of black smoke, even seen from afar, were indicators that things and people were on the move. They were conduits through which a whole nation flowed. They brought mail and produce, people and animals, all kinds of freight when they came and took it away when they went. Soldiers and salesmen, politicians and princes, students and scoundrels, lovers and newlyweds all made their way onto and off of platforms next to the country's rails and caught their first and last sight of hamlets and towns, farms and factories from the observation platforms mounted on cars ornate and plain. Just as churches were to the villages of medieval Europe, depots and the trains they serve were the center of everyday life in every city and town of any size in America for nearly two centuries. They told the time, reckoned the moment, were monuments to salvation and symbols of unimaginable power. They reminded everyone they were part of something much larger and more important than themselves. In a lesser way and in fewer places, they are, they are still some of these things, but they've lost their romance. Now trains are drawn by diesel-powered electric engines. There's no spewing steam, no bellowing stack of black smoke, comparatively little noise and not much in the way of whistles and bells. Pullman, smoking cars, dining cars, observation cars, mail cars, and cabooses are mostly gone. In times past, any child could define on sight a flat car, tank car, box car, refrigerator car, cattle car, and a host of other rolling stock. Today, it's all sort of an inconsequential hegemony. The magic is gone. My father started working on a rail local rail line in 1936, the same year he finished high school. His elder brother, my namesake, was already working for the company, and he probably got him the job. It was a good job. In those years of the Great Depression, it was a great job. The labor was hard and dangerous. The hours were long, and the future didn't offer much, really. But the work was steady, the wages were good, and the union was strong and protective. He was also able to buy a new Ford after only two years of working for the railroad. Except for the years when he was in the army overseas, fighting Nazism in Africa, Sicily, Italy, France, Belgium, and Germany, doing his bit as a corporal in the combat engineers, he worked for the railroad all of his life. One would think that the army would have found an assignment for him that had to do with railroad work. They didn't. His official designation was carpenter. He was, by his own admission, all thumbs, never a carpenter of any sort. But that's the Army's mentality. What he actually became was a rifleman, a rifleman who built bridges and made roads when he wasn't fighting and being shelled and bombed. He told me the engineers were the first into any combat area. As soon as we cleared the mines, built a bridge or dug some emplacements, then they'd send in the tanks and the infantry and, of course, the generals. He didn't have to join the Army. Being a railroad man meant he was protected from conscription, that he was doing essential war work, but he enlisted anyway. He said one of his good friends came home from work one afternoon and found a dead chicken hanging from his mailbox. He joined up the next day. So did my father. He'd never been farther than a couple of hundred miles from home, but he was soon on his way to more distant places than he'd ever imagined. He was gone nearly three years, was wounded, contracted malaria, won five bronze stars and a purple heart, and saw and did things he never wanted to talk about. He came back changed, and when he died, at age 66, of a combination of heart problems, diabetes, and neurological ailments, it was at least in part because of his combat experience. He suffered from insomnia, migraines, and a case of nerves for the rest of his life, but he never complained, and he seldom mentioned the war or that he had been a soldier. He gave me and my brother his medals to play with, and we soon lost them. He threw away his uniform, and he never joined any organizations like the VFW or American Legion. He once told my mother he didn't want any honor or recognition for what he had done. He later told me he never regretted going. It was his duty, 
but he also told me he had no respect for others who should have gone and didn't. He said he had less respect for those who came back and either bragged or complained about it. If I asked him a question about it, he would change the subject or make it into a joke. On a visit home from college, I found V letters he sent home to his mother from the front. They were very short and his handwriting was awful. When I chided him about it, he said, you never write home and your handwriting is worse. And you're not in a foxhole with artillery exploding all around you. A few years later, it appeared I would have to serve in combat in a tragically wrong war in Southeast Asia. I came home to tell him I was now 1A and liable for the draft, depending on the lottery draw the next weekend, if my number came up. I didn't intend to go. I arrived late and my mother had already gone to bed. He met me in our tiny kitchen. My father was not a drinking man, not in the least. But on the table there was a pack of Lucky Strikes, a new pint bottle of bourbon, and two glasses. Although I had not seen him for two months, he said nothing except for me to sit down. He broke the seal and poured, and we sat there in silence, smoking and drinking together. I was too shocked to say anything, and I dreaded the speech I figured he was about to make. He divided the dregs between us and said, Never drink whiskey with anything but water. It'll give you the bellyache. Then he looked out the window and said, I didn't go through that, so you would have to go through this. He told me to eat something, and he went to bed. As it turned out, my number was very high, and I didn't have to go or make the choice. I'm sure he was relieved, but he never said any more about it, and I never saw him drink whiskey again. Years later, I gave him a tape recorder and some blank cassettes. I asked him to record all he could remember of his war experience. My mother told me he diligently sat down on the dining table each night in, and with the machine running, talked for about an hour at a time into it. He would only do it if she was out of the house, maybe in the yard, out of earshot. It took him two months and he filled it up. It was six tapes, 90 minutes each. But one afternoon, she told me, she came in to find him running the machine with the microphone taped over. She asked what he was doing and he just shrugged. He re-recorded over all the tapes with silence. When she asked him why he did that, he told her he didn't want to remember it. He told me he never wanted to be a soldier. He also never wanted me to be a railroad man. I could have been. There was a legacy program whereby the son of an employee would go to the top of the list of any opening. He told me I was going to go to college and get a job and use my head and not my hands. You're going to go to college if I have to go around with holes in my britches, he said. I'll be damned if you'll spend your life working for the goddamn railroad. But he was proud of being a railroad man, even so. When he returned from the war and married my mother and had two sons, bought another new Ford and used a GI Bill to build a small house, he traveled some 85 miles to the largest, nearest large town, we thought it was a city, and opened a charge account in a large department store. Revolving charge accounts were very new then and not many people qualified for them. When he filled out the application and wrote down his salary, he told me the clerk behind the desk asked him to wait. Then she brought, brought out the store manager to shake his hand and thank him personally for his business. He liked to tell that story. It illustrated the pride he had in being a railroad man. I don't know exactly what job my father started with on the railroad. At some point, I knew he was a car catcher or an end man, a brakeman who rode in the caboose and sometimes served as a bull, or the man who threw bums and hobos off the trains when they climbed on for free rides. Once in passing, when we heard a reference to railroad bulls in a movie or on a television program, he shook his head and said he didn't like that work, so I knew, no, at some point he did it. But he advanced to conductor. I think that was after the war, and it was on a passenger train. The line he worked for soon ended its passenger service, though, and he returned to being a brakeman. He said once he didn't want to be a freight conductor since the work was the same as being a brakeman, but the responsibility was greater. Freight conductors usually rode in the caboose. By the time I knew enough to be aware that he was a railroad man, he was a head man, or a front brakeman who rode in the engine with the engineer and fireman. He also was responsible for jumping off the engine and running ahead to throw a switch 
while the train continued to move forward. A caboose, sometimes called a shack, doghouse, or a crummy, and other things less polite in railroad parlance, but never a caboose, were drafty and uncomfortable. Being at the end of the train, they tended to rock a lot more than other cars, since it was nothing to anchor them. When the train moved off or came to a stop, they jerked, the same way the tip of a whip jerks when it's unfurled rapidly and snapped. They had stoves that burned kerosene or coal. They had bunks padded with thin plastic-covered mattresses. They were dirty and hot in the summer and cold in the winter and poorly lighted all the time. Often they leaked when it rained. A man in our town bought one and put it in his backyard where he made a kind of workshop and outside the house getaway. My father thought he was nuts. What kind of dumbass wants a monkey house in his backyard? Locomotive engines weren't much more comfortable. The seats were metal and had no padding, and at every turn there was some hunk of iron or steel ready to gouge or poke. Locomotives were also smoky and oily and hot no matter what the weather. Diesels weren't much better. The smoke was gone, but they were greasy and hard. Still, riding in the engine was better than the caboose because they were up front in the wind. The railroad kept my father away from home a lot. He missed Christmases, Thanksgivings, Fourth of Julys and Labor Days, birthdays, anniversaries, and all kinds of parties and picnics, other events where fathers were always present. When he was out, he would be gone for three days at a time. Three on, three off was his schedule. It didn't vary. Rain or shine, sleet or snow, heat or flood, ill or well. Although he suffered from debilitating hay fever that was worse than any cold you can imagine and crippling migraines, he never took a sick day. So holidays and special occasions often came and went without him. He loved Christmas, though. I never knew exactly why. We had a radio in our Ford and, of course, in the house, but he never listened to it except at Christmas time. His favorite Christmas songs weren't hymns. He particularly liked silver bells, although we lived nowhere near any city. He couldn't really sing, but he could whistle the tune when it came on, and it made him soft and sentimental. Another holiday tune that moved him was, I'll Be Home for Christmas. One holiday season, he passed through the living room where I was watching a program called 20th Century, hosted by Walter Cronkite. That week's episode concerned the Battle of the Bulge, in which my father fought, although I didn't know that at the time. The picture on the set was of American G.I.s surrounded by the enemy and trudging through deep snow with explosions going on all around them. Under the films added in sound effects of booms and machine guns, the soundtrack played that song. He stopped and stared at the set for a moment, then lit a cigarette. After a few moments, I looked at him as he hadn't moved or said anything, and I saw tears running down his face. It was one of the few times I ever saw him cry. It only lasted for a beat or two, and he moved on. But I never hear that song or see any footage of that battle without thinking of him. I cannot imagine his pain. But that sadness didn't really infect his love of Christmas. It may have been because of me and my brother. Our mother had no love for the Christmas holiday. Her father, already widowed, had died on Christmas Eve, 1938, leaving her and her six siblings in the charge of an elderly great-great-aunt in the depths of the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. It ruined the holiday for her forever, even into her dotage. But my father loved the whole season, the food, the atmosphere, and especially the gifts. I remember many Christmas mornings sitting and looking longingly and anxiously at wrapped presents under the tree, eager to dive in, but our mother always made us wait if he was due back that morning so she, he could watch us open our gifts and play with them. Sometimes he didn't show up till afternoon, and the delay was agonizing. One Christmas I awoke to find an elaborate Lionel model train set, all assembled and ready to use. He got his call to go to work about midnight, but he worked furiously for two solid hours and managed somehow to get the whole thing unpacked and set up in a huge circle that dominated our small living room. It featured an old steamer that made smoke and had lights and whistles with seven cars and a caboose, and there was a model depot and warehouse, crossing gates that went up and down, and a water tower to go with it. It took up all of the living room that wasn't occupied by the Christmas tree. He was out that Christmas day, so I didn't have to wait to start. I ran that railroad all day long, and 
had to be dragged away to my grandmother's to eat Christmas dinner. By the time he came in two days later, the new had worn off it, though. I think it disappointed him that I had grown bored and abandoned it for other toys. He played with it himself for a day or two, then ordered it dismantled so our mother could clean. Christmas at our house ended quickly, a concession I now understand of our mother's seasonal sadness. I don't think I ever set up that model train again. Years later, he got it out of the storeroom and gave it away. The rail line he worked for was a small subsidiary of a large railroad. Once the line had great ambitions, but a combination of economic downturns and steel shortages and finally the Depression limited it to a connector line, joining two major railroads in the coastal regions of the country in a web of freight and people movement. The town we lived in was a major junction, though, and we would have to work to, he would have to, work to switch cars to make up new trains to make the run to another junction some 114 miles away. He especially hated switch work in the yard. It was tedious and dangerous, and he thought beneath him. Switch brakemen or fielders weren't respected, but an agreement between the union and management meant that everyone had to work the switch yards each time before a run. During his annual two weeks vacation, we went to California to visit his brother, or to New Mexico, or Alabama, or Mississippi to visit our mothers, brothers, and sisters. We could have gone on the train for free as he had a pass to ride any passenger line in the country. Good for the whole family. We never did that. We always drove in the family car. He said it was no vacation for him to ride the railroad. Trains on it ran on a strict schedules, and all railroad men had to carry a railroad-approved watch. For years, these were, these were always Hamilton pocket watches. But in the mid-1960s, two wristwatches were approved the Hamilton 505, and the Boulevard Accutron. Both had to have railroad faces, and both boasted superbly accurate timing. My father insisted on trading in his pocket watch for the Boulevard. It had been developed by NASA and was supposedly the watch astronauts would wear to space. Accurate down to less than one six-thousandth of a second, or so the claim went, it had a tuning fork inside it. It never needed winding, hummed rather than ticked, it was totally waterproof and durable enough to take the kind of abuse working on the railroad would dish out. I don't think my father was more proud of anything he ever owned than he was of that watch. He always removed his old pocket watch chain and fob and left them on his dresser when he wasn't going to work, but he wore that bulova everywhere. And he showed it to everyone, over and over again. After a while, even I noticed that people teased him about it. Hey, let's see your watch, some friend or relative would say out of the blue. I don't think he ever caught on to the fact that he was being joshed. He immediately rolled back his cuff and show it off, launching into his patented litany of the watch's virtues. He wore it till the day he died. After that, I took it and wore it for years until the tuning fork finally played out. Sticklers for on-time schedules or not, though, no one ever knew when a train would be coming in and a new crew would be, get their orders. Party lines were the norm when I was young, but we had one of the first private telephone lines in our community. Railroad men had to have a phone so the dick scratcher, as the dispatcher was called, could call the crews and summon them to the depot. It could be any time of the day or night, and they rarely had more than a couple of hours notice. Often my father had to stay at home waiting by the phone for the call when he had rather have been at some family function or out doing something with his friends. We also had one of the first refrigerated air conditioners in our town. It was installed in my parents' bedroom. A lot of people don't know that these early electrified freon cooled window unit air conditioners were originally built to keep perishables cold on railroad cars. They were adapted for home installation in the 60s and railroad men were among the first to buy them. The unit not only kept him comfortable when he slept during the day after he came home from his three on, it also shuttered outside noise. He kept it chilly in there, down to 60 degrees or so when it was well over 100 outside. My brother and I regarded it as a treat to be able to go in and lie down on the, our parents' bed in the super cooled air during the hottest days of August. When he came home from his three on, after having slept a few hours here and there in a caboose, he would be dirty and greasy. He smelled of metal and leather, oil and smoke, stale coffee and tobacco. He, all, he always wore overalls, always washed and ironed by our mother, 
and stiff, so, starch so stiff they would almost stand up over a co soft collar shirt and a necktie with a flat striped hat, a red kerchief, and high lace-up steel-toed work boots, scarred from stepping on the stirrups and flipping himself up to the grab iron on cars and engines after throwing a switch. He frequently suffered from sprained ankles and torn ligaments, but he just laced the boots tighter and toughed it out. Toughing it out was in many ways his attitude toward everything. He didn't believe in excuses. In winter, he wore a denim jumper with a cap and ear flaps. He carried switch keys and a glim or a special three-bulb battery-powered lantern, which I still have, and heavy leather gloves that were stained black with oil and grime. He was not a big man, only 5'6", but he seemed like a giant when he came through the door. He would be so tired sometimes, all, it was all he could do to bathe, eat, and go to bed. Much of my childhood was spent tiptoeing around and whispering so he could sleep. To make too much noise and awaken him was to risk his terrible wrath, particularly when he had a headache. We t hoped, though, that there would be a payoff for our care, that when he awoke we would do something, and we usually did. My father always proclaimed that he hated the goddamn railroad, but as I grew older I noticed that we never passed a train that didn't capture his attention, never walked past a rail museum he didn't want to go into. I know he had a photograph over the workbench of our storeroom. Two were of the locomo first locomotives he ever worked on, 12-wheelers both, and one was of a first ever train made up entirely of automotive, automobile carriers. He also kept a framed photograph of his line's logo there, out of sight in a way, but where he could always see it, I think it reminded him of who he was, who he could talk, he would talk about how much he admired the diesel locomotives, reveled in explaining how Westinghouse air brake or Coupler or Lincoln Penny or Johnson Bar worked, and swore that he was so glad to see those old steam locomotives go away. But I noticed that when an old steamer would chug through our town before they came, became utterly obsolete, he would stop and listen for the whistle. And if it was in sight, he'd stand still and watch it pass, a faraway look on his face, as the smoke from the stack faded in the distance. I also remember going with him to the depot to pick up his check. I recall the sound of the telegraph tick ticking in the dispatcher's office, seeing the long wooden benches where passengers waited for trains, watching the po postman sorting mail into bags to be deposited on hooks, strategically placed trackside near rural post offices where trains didn't stop so they could be snatched by a rail mailman using a hoop. I remember the oddly shaped chest-high desks where the clerks with green eye shades and sleeve protectors stood and filled out paperwork using steel nibbed pens and inkwells and the echoes of voices in the high ceiling waiting area. There was an odor in the waiting room, a kind of metallic smell laced with linseed oil and disinfectant of some sort. I recall looking into the baggage room and seeing the red caps smoking, playing dice, cards, waiting for the next arrival. I remember him talking of his work with other railroad men. I learned railroad terms early and found out about idlers and hot boxes and frozen buckles and fusees, about green eyes and clear eyes and wigwags, knew what a clogged cut and a riprap and a lay-by were. I learned how switches and humps work. I heard about the fear they all had of derailments and icy tracks, and I sensed his pain when he would come in after some poor soul fatally wandered out onto the tracks in front of a screaming locomotive that would take miles to stop. I also heard of men who died working for the railroad, of those who lost fingers and hands, feet and legs, who missed a flip or fell between the cars as they raced along the towpaths and joined the birds or jumped from one car to another while the train hurtled along at 60 miles per hour. I also heard about hobos and bums, about jammed brakes and hop toads, I understood the difference between grades and gates, cuts and passes. I heard him talking about mile longs, a train that would extend that far, cow catcher to caboose coupling, about double headers and bad orders. A railroad was a world of its own, and all of the miseries and dangers and glories and pleasures of life lay along its steel rails. From before I was born, we were a railroad family. One of the first rhymes I ever learned was this. Railroad crossing, look out for the cars. Can you spell that without any R's? <laughs>
What of my proudest possession was a nickel laid on the track and squashed flat by a passing train. I still carry a red bandana instead of a handkerchief. I am, after all, the son of a railroad man. Our mother, of course, was a railroad man's wife. Because he would finish his three on at any time of the day or night, she was attuned to the sound of trains arriving. No matter what the hour, when she heard that whistle and later the horn of the engines, she would rise from her chair or her bed, come in from chatting with a neighbor or break off watching a TV show or reading a book, and she'd make him a supper. It was the only thing in the world that could induce her to leave a church service before the benediction. Three in the morning or three in the afternoon, it didn't matter. It was never a small meal. It would usually have fried steak or chicken and gravy, potatoes, vegetables, fresh-made biscuits or cornbread, pie or cake for dessert, often with ice cream. My father loved nothing more than ice cream. Summers would find him out on our back porch, hand-cranking one of his favorites, peach pecan, with me commissioned to chip chunks of ice off a block he had toted home from the town's ice house and feeding it into the sides of the maker, dousing it with them with rock salt to ensure a proper melt in temperature. Ice cream and peanut butter, which he would reap right out of the jar, I think, were his two favorite foods in the world. He would come in exhausted, but clearly happy and relieved to be home, bathe and dress for bed, even if it was the middle of the afternoon, eat his meal, smoke a lucky strike, then sleep for several hours. Sometimes our mother said that when she heard that whistle, it was like he was calling her. The six blasts, long short, long short, long short, always signaled that the train was approaching the yard. She said it was like hearing, come on, Pauline, come on. It was her call to duty in a way. It became a kind of family joke. Many times when we were all going out together, he'd be standing in the driveway next to one of our successive Fords, exasperated by her taking so long to get ready and out the door. We'd hear him call finally, come on, Pauline, come on. To say that to our father loved our mother would not be sufficient. He revered her. He idolized her. He never thought she, he was good enough for her, although she had grown up very poor, and his family had weathered the depression in severely diminished circumstances, but with comparative comfort. As a railroad family, we were never rich or prosperous, but she had what she wanted and what he could provide. She had to be careful about what she asked for sometimes. Once, they were walking past a gift shop window, and she spied a particularly large and ugly ceramic swan in full wing and in the motion of landing in a bowl fashioned to look like splashing water. She said something about admiring it, but she was being sarcastic. Even I could tell that. He missed the irony, and on his next payday, he bought it for her. I don't know how much it cost, probably too much, and I know she hated it. But for the rest of her life, it was a centerpiece of our dining table. Eventually, she became proud of it. I think she was always especially careful not to break it when we moved it, when it was moved. I think it came to represent how hard he worked, how much he loved her, and that made it beautiful. My father didn't intend to be a railroad man for life. His father had been a horseman, a wrangler, for the local mill, although he also carried the mail and often would go out to the track that ran only a few dozen yards behind their home and hang the postal bag on the hoop for the passing train to grab when it raced by their rural community. My father loved horses, though, and he always wanted to raise them, or in the proper, proper parlance, run them. Once, when he and my mother were repainting a room in their home, he ran out, they ran out of paint and he left to go buy more at the hardware store downtown. She waited and waited. Hours went by and he didn't return. Finally, she looked out the window and saw him coming up the alley behind our house, leading a small Welsh mare someone had sold him. She was furious. She thought the horse was a waste of time and money. He said it was a gift for my younger brother, but we all knew better. It was for him, although I never saw him ride her. We kept the mare in a rented corral and stable for several years until he finally sold her. Being a railroad man didn't leave him much time for horses. Another time he was approached by two friends who wanted him to go in with them by a section of land. A section is one square mile. Their notion was that they would all pitch in and farm it and he would have pasture set aside to run some horses. 
He wanted to do it, but our mother said no. She remembered what it was like to be poor and to be victimized by foolish schemes and bad investments, something that her father had indulged in too often. The men found another partner, and years later, oil was discovered on the land, and they became wealthy. She told me my father never mentioned it to her, not even when he could no longer work for the railroad and had to take odd jobs, one of which was plowing fields for one of those same men on that same land. She said it was the single thing in their marriage that she always regretted, not letting him have a place to run his horses. But he probably was no more a horseman than he was a field hand. He was a railroad man. When I was young and before we had air conditioning in the rest of the house, I would lie awake at night and listen to the trains coming through our town. We were, as I said, at a junction, and there were three major lines that intersected there and passenger lines as well. We thought our town was special because we had two separate depots and one of the lines had the same name as our town. There was also a large switching yard and a roundhouse and a Y. We could hear the trains working all day and night arriving and leaving, and we could hear the switchyards working, cars banging and crashing together as they were dropped over the hump and slammed into each other, all punctuated by whistles and bells. Train noise was part of my town's culture, part of my childhood experience. But I never could hear my father's train, distinguish it from the others. When I, but my mother always could. When I asked her about it later in life, she only said, only his said, Come on, Pauline, come on. My father had a reputation for being a practical joker in the town. People liked that about him, I think. He had a mischievous streak that sometimes manifests itself in wise ways, though. When I was 14, I got my driving license. You could do that in Texas in those days. Anyone could. I had the use of his work car, a 1953 Chevy. I took it out one night with some friends, and as usual, he gave me a curfew, 11 o'clock. We went to a basketball game and then got in someone else's car and rode around for a while, then well past 11. When they dropped me off at the car around midnight, it wouldn't start. I had no idea why or what to do. I tried and tried, but it just wouldn't start. I walked home three miles in the dark. When I got up the next morning, I found a spark plug wire on my bed. He came to my room and grinned at me and said, walk back and put it in. That was all he ever said. I never miss curfew again. My father's health did not sustain him for as long as he should have. I'm sure it was all those cholesterol-laden, butter-slathered meals and sugary desserts that didn't help. He smoked, but he didn't drink alcohol. It wasn't a moral or religious thing with him. He just got enough of that when he was young, he said. When he was in his 50s, he developed diabetes. It ran in the family, so it wasn't entirely unexpected. It eventually diminished his eyesight. Railroad men... Headman in particular had to be able to see 2020 with spectacles. Glaucoma impaired his vision, and the railroad forced him to retire long before he was ready to. That was the worst thing that ever happened to my father. It wasn't so much that he didn't work, couldn't work, not and collect his medical pension, which was totally inadequate, or that my mother had to take a job outside the home and earn most of our living, or that he wasn't glad to be free of the goddamn railroad. It was that he lost his identity. He had been a railroad man all his life. More than being a husband, a father, a decorated veteran, a 32-degree mason, a respected and well-liked member of the community, a solid citizen, he saw himself as a railroad man. But he was no longer. I think it broke his spirit. After that, he took what work he could find, farmhand, motel manager, hardware store clerk. He always said that an able-bodied man who didn't work wasn't worth a damn. There was always a job out there, he told me. May a hundred, maybe a thousand times. He insisted that my brother and I work at something from the time we were old enough to do so. He tolerated play, admired study, but he expected work, hard labor if nothing else was available. One summer when I was older, I couldn't find anything suitable. He arranged for me to have a job at a construction company, building a new factory in the town. The foreman had no need for me, I could tell, and he only took me on as a favor to my father. He gave me make-work chores, such as moving a huge pile of sand from one side of the construction site to another with a shovel and a wheelbarrow. It would, he told me, take me all day. When I chose instead to make use of a Caterpillar front loader I discovered sitting idly nearby and completed the job in an hour, 
he told me I was too much of a smart ass and let me go. My father was furious with me. It was one of my many bitter fights we had when I was a teenager. Like many men of small stature I have known, my father had a very short temper, but unfathomable depths of remorse after losing it. He would blow up in a wink and it would take him a long time to get over an outburst that sometimes would cause him to say things he would regret. Ultimately, this divided us. Like most men of his generation, he believed in corporal punishment. My brother and I grew up in dread of a whipping, usually administered with his belt. None was ever severe or really painful. It was more about the embarrassment. They stopped when we were about 10 or 11, except for one time. When I was 17 and foolishly rebellious, as most kids are at that age, we had a towering argument about something he thought I had done, something I had in fact not done. We were in our living room arguing bitterly and loudly, and he finally said I was going to get a whipping and started taking off his belt. I am and was a bigger man, taller than he by six inches, much heavier. I told him I wouldn't stand for it, and I held him by the shoulders and forced him down into a chair. Then I left. That caused a rift between us that never really healed. He was always wary of me after that, distant and guarded. We had many good times together in the next 15 years, wonderful moments of intimacy and candor and love, but there was always that incident between us. No matter how long I live, I will never cease regretting that one impulsive action. I have often wished that I had subdued my anger, swallowed my pride, and taken my whipping. It would never have hurt that much, lasted that long. I never could figure out how to repair that rift, although I would give anything to do so. Like hundreds of other railroad towns across America, my hometown eventually lost the railroad, and that broke its spirit too. Trains still came through, but they dismantled the terminals, closed the depots. Diesels didn't need water or coal, so they didn't stop. They switched through. The last passenger line, the Texas Zephyr, stopped service two years after my father retired. After that, it was all freight. The short line he worked for was bought out, shut down. The routes were changed. The tracks taken up. The roundhouse, Y, and switching yard closed, allowed to fall into ruin, eventually demolished and sold for scrap. The old cuts that were so meticulously maintained filled with tumbleweeds and dirt. Men who still work for the railroad relocated to large cities from where they could be more efficiently dispatched. Crews were summoned by beepers, then cell phones from centralized locations, sometimes a whole continent away. Switching was done by computers with only minimal crews needed. Trains no longer required an engineer, a fireman, a conductor, multiple brakemen. They got on fine with two-man crews. Electronics did the routing, controlled the switches, gates, signals, gave the orders. Western Union offices that were part of the depot's heartbeat were closed and moved to Walmarts and supermarkets. The depots were either raised or turned into kitchen restaurants or gift shops for tourists. The old locomotives and some of the early diesels were put on side tracks and turned into museums. The age of the railroad passed. It was, its trains still run, but it isn't the same. When they stopped using cabooses, it was the close of a chapter. My father didn't live to see most of that. I think it was a good thing. It would have broken his heart. He was a railroad man. I don't think he would have wanted to live in a world without railroads. I think about my father's being a railroad man a lot. I think of the long, frigid nights, the blistering hot days he worked for my family, and I think about how much of life he missed working for the railroad, about how much he hated it, how much he loved it, how much it made him who he was. On the day of his funeral, the procession moved out of the First Baptist Church and slowly made its way to the cemetery across the tracks toward the outskirts of town. As the procession passed through the downtown district of our small town, the signals on Main Street grade crossing lights came on and everything stopped as a freight train highballed through. My mother, seated in the funeral home limo with our family, chuckled and sighed. He spent all of his life waiting for a train, she said. When I turned 60, I did something I never thought I would do. I got a tattoo. It is the logo of my, my father's short line railroad. I don't know if he would have approved of it or not. I'm certain my mother would not have. But I wanted to do it. 
felt somehow that I was obliged to do it. I think of it as a reminder of him, of how much he loved us and how hard he worked for us and how proud I am to be the son of a railroad man. It's my personal memorial. I will have it forever. My mother died a few years ago. She outlived my father by more than 30 years, but she always saw herself as the wife of a railroad man. She never saw a train, even an Amtrak or a coal train or some other freighter highballing across the landscape that she didn't notice and comment on it. Never heard an engine's horn without perking up, even when her mind was almost gone. At her graveside service in the town cemetery, the minister finished his remarks and we sat for a moment in the searing heat of a late September afternoon and contemplated her pristine white coffin and the flowers covering it, waiting for it to be lowered into the grave next to his. In the distance, a freight train was blowing through our small town. It wouldn't stop, but as the custom was the custom and the law, when it approached the old main junction, the engineer sounded the horn. My wife and brother, seated next to me on either side, both gripped my hands suddenly. N none of us is the sort to believe much in signs, signals, spiritualization, and the like, but we all heard it as clearly as a resonance from a lifetime of listening. The train's horn echoed across the prairie from the grade crossing like the voice of a railroad man. Come on, Pauline, it said. Come on. Thank you.